3140 uh, gets into some acid base stuff. So here we have a 0.25 molar solution of the conjugate base. It gives us the pK of the acid, hydrocyanic or cyanic acid. Uh, so what we want to do here first is I took the pK and made it into a pKb for the conjugate for the cyanide. And I subtracted that from 14, so that's going to be 4.79. And then I found the Kb from that by doing 10 to the negative, 4.79. And that Kb came out to be 1.62 times 10 to the negative fifth. I set that equal to x squared over the concentration, which is 0.25 molar. I solved for x, and then I took the negative log of that x, and that was my pOH. I got that to come out to be 2.7. means that my pH would be 14 minus that, which is 11.3, and therefore C is my answer. Okay. Uh, 32, we're given the autoionization reaction for water. So if we take a look at that, that's two water molecules colliding, turning into a hydronium and a hydroxide. Okay. It gives us the Kw at 60 degrees is 10 to the negative 13th. We know, of course, that the Kw for this is 10 to the negative 14th at standard temperature, 25 degrees. So we're seeing the Kw increase, which means our equilibrium cost is larger, which means we expect more products at a higher temperature. Now, the reason for that is because as your molecules start moving faster and faster, there's going to be larger collisions, which is more likely then that an H plus could be jarred loose and transferred over to something else. Okay. So if we look at the shifting here, we're seeing a shift as the temperature goes up. That means that this is going to be an endothermic reaction, right? So as we're adding energy to it, then we're seeing an a shift to this side. So from Le Chatelier's principle, we can really simply say that one is incorrect here. So we know this is wrong because if it were exothermic and we increase the temperature, we'd see a shift in the other direction and our K would decrease. The second part says a sample of pure water is slightly acidic. Now the pH will be below seven, but so will the pOH. And really, acidity is not about pH, it's about how your H plus and OH minus are balanced. And so, as long as you're starting from pure water, you're not gonna be able to produce an equal amounts of those unless you add an acid or a base to it. And so, two is also incorrect, and therefore D is our option for that. Okay, 33, we're also looking at equilibrium. Now we're ditching the acid base. And we're looking at this. Now, an important point here is that solids in equilibrium, remember, are not influenced by amount. So, so it says, which change will lead to more CO2 present in equilibrium? So adding more barium carbonate is, is not going to lead to a greater amount of CO2. Actually, make it slightly less as we're kind of crowding the container. Uh, however, it's pressure, so the pressure would still be the same. So one, nope. And then increasing the volume of the container will lead to an increase in amount of CO2. It will not lead to an increase in pressure of CO2. Uh, and really simply here, if we're looking at a Kp value, it's going to be equal to whatever the pressure of the CO2 is. And that's not changed. So the only time your equilibrium constant changes, remember, is when your temperature changes. And so, and so the fact that we're, we're dealing with just an increase in volume means that our Kp is going to remain constant, which means that our pressure will also remain constant. And so for 33 here, uh, we're looking at neither one nor two, and B is our correct answer. Okay, 34, the best thing to do here is just do the whole calculation. There's two calculations here. So if we have a uh, pure solution of calcium hydroxide, we're, let's write that out. So the reaction we're looking for here is the dissolving of the calcium hydroxide. So we're gonna end up at equilibrium with X and two X. We're going to plug that into our KSP expression, which is going to be the calcium ion concentration times the hydroxide ion concentration squared. So if we plug in x here and we plug in 2x here to be squared, we end up with our KSP is equal to 4x cubed. Now really at this level you should just have that memorized that for one and two parts ions we're going to end up with 4x cubed. For a one to one ratio we're going to end up with x squared. Uh, that should be readily available. So, so if we take our KSP and set that equal to 4x cubed, then we end up finding that x in that case is 0.0126. Okay. 
then we have a second calculation where they say we put 0.1 moles of NaOH into a liter of saturated solution. That's going to shift our equilibrium way to the left. So we're going to end up with much, much less of this dissolved. So in that case, we want to plug in 0.1 here instead of 2x. So 0.1 squared, uh, take KSP away from that, and then our calcium concentration remaining is how much calcium hydroxide has been dissolved in there. So if we divide this by that 0.1 squared, we end up with an x in that case of 8 times 10 to the negative 4. If we take the ratio of those two amounts of how much has been dissolved, we end up with 93.7%. So now we go to our choices, about 50% as much, 75, 95, or 99. So this is probably tempting to just go to that automatically, but C is our best answer here. We are closest to 95% being precipitated away. Okay, now we're looking at formic acid. It gives us the pKa. Uh, wants to know which indicator use is appropriate. So we're looking at a weak acid. So if we kind of give a quick, here's a pH of 7. Then what we're going to see is we're going to start with some pH of a weak acid. And we're going to get into a buffering region, and then we're going to have our equivalence point somewhere above 7. Okay. So, so the bromophenol blue is a terrible choice here because that's right around the PK, and that PK, actually this, you can see the error in my drawing here, our PK should be you know, at this pH of 3.75. So our PK it should be at this inflection point. So this is going to be transitioning here in the buffer region, which is really far from where we, where we have our equivalence point. So with this indicator, we're going to get an end point that's so far removed from our equivalence point that it's ridiculous. Now on the other one, we're looking at a transition where we're transitioning between 6.8 and 8, so that's a little more over here, which should be really close, hopefully, to our, where our end point and equivalent point are about the same, so therefore 2 is our best option. Now at that point, you could say, well, well maybe it should be slightly higher, but really, I'm, I'm just not drawing this well, really our inflection point should be fine. Um, but as long as you're above 7 for the transition, that should be fine. Even a transition at 7 should probably be fine, unless it's a really, really weak acid. And pK of 3.75 is at that point where I wouldn't question that. Okay. More equilibrium. So here we are given a reaction. Uh, this is NH4 plus reacting with water in an acid base reaction wants to know how we can increase the amount of H3O plus ions. So if we dilute the solution, we're going to decrease the concentration of this, and if you've done a calculation, you know that that's going to decrease the amount of H plus. I mean, obviously, a dilute acid is going to have less H plus than a concentrated acid. Uh, we can bear that out with our calculation. So when we add an extra liter of, of water, then what's going to happen is this value is going to drop, and that's going to cause this value to have to drop as well to still equal to the Ka value. So we know that 1 is incorrect. And then in part 2, raising the temperature from 25 to 35, that we need to look at how that shift's going to go. So the way I, like, I recommend doing this, we have delta H is greater than 0, therefore this is an endothermic reaction. So we're putting energy into it in order for this to happen. And so therefore, What's going to happen when we increase the temperature is we're increasing the amount of energy, and that's going to cause a shift to the right. Okay, and a shift to the right means that our H3O plus concentration is going to go up, and therefore B would be our correct answer. Okay, 37, we have an electrochemistry question, but really this is a Le Chatelier's principle one. Um, Let's kind of do the analysis here. So we're starting with a, a battery. It's non-standard conditions because this is not one molar. And then it says, how will the following two things, or which one will increase the measured potential? Okay. So, so if we're looking at copper turning into copper 2 plus, and silver plus turning into silver, here's our unbalanced reaction. Of course, to balance it, we just need twos on the silvers. So, from a Le Chatelier's principal standpoint, if we increase the copper 2 plus concentration, that's going to cause a shift back towards the reactants, and therefore that's going to be a lower voltage. Uh, really, you can bear that through a little bit more 
accurately by actually saying that the increase of the copper two is going to cause a greater pull in the electrons in the opposite direction of the way you want them to travel, and therefore uh, this is going to cause a decrease in the voltage. Okay. And the second one, the adding of the chloride is going to cause this to precipitate out, which means that this concentration is going to go down. As, as in part one, this concentration was going up. In this one, the concentration of this goes down, and that's again going to cause a shift back to the left, which is going to result in a decrease in the voltage. Or alternatively, we have fewer positively charged cations pulling on those electrons, and therefore the energy gained by the electrons drops. So neither of these are correct, and D is our choice there. Okay, 38, we're just doing a balancing of a reaction. So our two half reactions, we have MnO4 minus, comes into MnO2. Okay, so to balance that, we ended up putting, we need to balance our waters, and we're in acidic. So we need two waters, four H pluses, and then we need three electrons. Okay, and our second reaction, we are looking at, well, I'm sorry, we're not in acidic conditions, we're in basic conditions. Uh, so, so in order to balance it in basic conditions, we then need to neutralize this with hydroxides. Four hydroxides on each side will keep these equivalent. Okay, then that will turn these into four waters. And we can rewrite our balance equation as three electrons plus two waters plus the permanganate yields an MnO2. And we've canceled those out and four hydroxides. Okay. And our second reaction uh, is a little simpler. So we have copper, copper hydroxide. So to balance that, we can just go ahead and add the two hydroxides and the two electrons. Okay. Um, after that, we're going to need to double all of this. And we're going to need to triple all of this. And then we're going to need to combine them all. So it wants to know what the coefficient and the location of the water is. So since this one doesn't have any water in it, we don't have to worry about that canceling with this. We're going to have two water molecules times two, so we're going to have four, and they're going to be on the reactant side. And so B would be our correct choice there. Okay, 39, uh, we're just looking at oxidation states, nice and simple. So we have minus two for each oxygen. That means that the osmium is plus eight. Five nitrogens with a plus one charge means that each one is plus one fifth or plus 0.2. Um, the CO here is neutral, so this would be zero, as far as I know. And the fluoride here is minus one each, so that the xenon must be plus six to add up to a total of minus two. Okay. So highest oxidation state would be osmium plus eight. And then the last one, what's the standard reduction potential for mercury 2 plus to mercury? So this is a little challenging because it's tempting to just kind of try and blend these two together. The fail-proof way that will always work is turn both of them into delta Gs. So you want to make them into delta Gs because the delta G is a state function just like enthalpy and there before. We're, we're very confident that we can add two things up that they'll go from start to finish and we'll have to worry about what happens in the middle. Same can't always be said with the with the voltages, so it depends on the number of electrons. So the fail-proof way is to just go from the voltage to the Gibbs free energy. Now for this first reaction there, we know that the Gibbs free energy is equal to negative NF E naught cell. Okay, so we have two for our N, we have 96,500 for our Faraday constant, and our voltage is plus 0.9. Okay, so we're gonna end up with a positive. I'm sorry, negative Gibbs free energy. So this top one is negative 173, 700, and that is in joules per mole Kelvin. I'm sorry, joules per mole. And then the second one, uh, same, same equation, still two electrons, 96,500, but now it's 0 0.8. So it's gonna be slightly different. This is negative 154, 400 joules per mole.
So what works out really nicely here is actually if you just add these two reactions as is, this will cancel, this will cancel, and you'll end up with two mercury two pluses plus four electrons yield two mercury. Okay, which is which is kind of what we want, except it's doubled. Uh, and so what we can do is we can just add these two together. So we know that our Gibbs free energy for this is going to be equivalent to negative 328, 100. And we know that's equal to negative NF9. And so we can divide this by negative 4, divide by 96,500, and we get our voltage is equal to plus 0.85 volts. And therefore, B is our answer there.